Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. And the people who were attracted were led astray into troubles and were greatly misled and grew old experiencing no pleasure and died finding no truth, never knowing the true God. This is the way that they were enslaved all of creation from the foundation of the world until now. The Apocryphon of John. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio, and I thank all of you for taking the time to join us this evening in live broadcast. I'm especially honored to have my good friend, Dr. Joy Jeffries Pugh, on with me. Dr. Joy, are you there? Yes. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, and thank you for uh, joining us again. It's always a pleasure to do a broadcast with you and to speak about all things esoteric. And so, a lot going on in the world, and so I'm uh, looking forward to the update. Um, Dr. Joy, would you like to just give out your website contact information and anything as far as social media that you'd like to share before we go into uh, some of these topics? Yes, uh, my website is www.drjoy, D-R-J-O-Y-E, that's joy with an E, dot com. And at my website, there are all my books and everything, all my information is there. And if you want to send me any information, like a submission form, there's a submission form there. You can ask questions and you can see all the work that I've done. And you can also find me on my Facebook page at Joy, J-O-Y-E, that's Joy with an E, and the last name is Pew, P-U-G-H. And you can send me a friend request and keep up with the great things that are going on and the opportunities that you can have to listen to me on radio shows like tonight. Excellent. And um, Dr. Joy and I join John the Baptist once a month um, on Tribulation-Now. And we just did a show about a week and a half ago and it was about what's going on with regard to the martial law and the setup uh, for all of the crackdowns and then the racial uh, tensions and conflicts that are going on between the police and the public and so I do recommend that people check out that show what we're going to be talking about tonight will be somewhat of a follow-up on some of that and so it will greatly bless you I believe if you do you get a chance to check that out? And you can find a link on my Facebook page. Um, but Dr. Joy, you you did want to cover some of you know a follow up with all of that as well. But um, before doing so, can you just talk about what you are currently working on? And you should have a a book being released uh, shortly as well through Sacred Word Publishing. Oh, yes. I'm really excited about this book. And you know, Zen, that this has been a book in the, in the making for quite a number of years now. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, when my husband was very, very sick and was almost uh, on his deathbed at that time, uh, I lost this book. And so it has taken me a couple of years to really want to get back into, you know, writing it and, and getting it back to where I really once had it. Because Unfortunately, when the Geek Squad tried to come and find it on my laptop, it was completely gone. How how I lost an entire book that I had worked on for years was just amazing. But I'm so thankful to have gotten that completed. The manuscript is completed now. And it's uh, Special Parables of Joy, and it's Triumphs of the Disabled. And what the book is about, I worked for many years, uh, for almost 13 years, with handicapped people. And um, I did a lot of coaching of Special Olympics. And so some of the stories that are in this particular book, they're all true. And um, it talks about where some people started in trying to learn about the spirit that lives within them that can drive you much greater than your physical capabilities. Sometimes you've been told that you can't do. And so it's triumphs that these people were able to do by focusing on uh, th the right things and, and, and using God to inspire them and just all kinds of little things like that. And it's also included in that book will be a lot of the fight and the struggle that I had 
as an administrator against a society that was not ready to accept people who were handicapped uh, into the mainstream and into uh, recognizing them for their accomplishments. So there, there's stories that you will laugh. There's stories that you will cry. There's stories that you'll probably get very angry to know what it was like on the front lines back in those days of trying to get the opportunity for people to have, you know, legally rights to public education and the, and the ability not to have to stand on the sidelines of life. So it's a, uh, it's going to be a book that I hope that people will read and will be inspired, you know, by it. Because lots of times we think that our handicaps limit us. And so many times, especially when you're dealing with the, the physically and the mentally disabled, like I was dealing with, you know, they were having to accomplish things that their physical bodies were not allowing them to do. But when the mental capability was very limited and, um, you know, that was back in the day when people were very cruel, when a person was a Down syndrome, they wanted them to stay at home, they didn't really want them to be exposed to people out in the community. And so there's a lot of reality of what life was like. And it and it also talks about, you know, I, I wrote it from a perspective of how it made me grow. And I think that's the thing is that you're going to understand the struggle that I had and, and how hard and very difficult it was as a young person starting out and trying to make a way in a path where there had never been a path before. And you had to go at it with no other uh, indication. Is this going to work? Is it not going to work? So there was many times that I had to step outside the boat that had always been there for the way that they had always done things. And I had to make this path on my own because there was nobody to follow. It was, it was trudging through the forest and trying to do the right things. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And sometimes I really paid a heavy price for trying to stand up for right and for truth and for doing, you know, good for the people that I served. Many times people in those positions, they're there for the money. They're not there for the person. But I took on those people as if they were my own family members. And I, every day I would put myself in their place. How would I want to be treated? How would I want somebody to help me? What can I do? What what would I want to be done to give me opportunities that nobody else will give me? So I always put myself in their place to see how it would be to be in that and then to have somebody help you under those circumstances. And I tell you, Zen, it really prepared me having to deal with what I dealt with there for uh, about 13 years uh, and having to deal with handicapped people. My mother became very handicapped. She fought cancer for nine and a half years. My grandmother, who I also looked after during that period of time, became an Alzheimer's patient and was very, very sick. And then, of course, uh, my husband, who took a flu shot and completely deteriorated into uh being you know, taken care of by me 24 uh, 7 in my home in a hospital bed unable to even move he was fed through a feeding tube and had a tracheotomy and it was a 24 hour day that i really never slept so i i, I think that god prepared me for having to deal with handicapped people and and you know and i i i learned how to stand up for people who need or have no voice. Uh And so it prepared me for, for what I had to do in my own life, never dreaming that when I was going through all that, that that was like that. So I'm really excited uh, that this book is finally, you know, uh, the manuscripts finished and hopefully in the near future, you know, this book will be out and that you all at sacred word publishing will be able to, uh, to get that out to people who are interested in knowing this because I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize the struggle that people who are handicapped have to go through. And this book really will open your eyes uh, to that struggle and the early struggle that was going on, you know, back in the, in the early uh, 80s and, and how hard it was uh, to even, you know, have an opportunity to do anything. It was like people just said, hey, you're handicapped, stay at home. There was no ways to get into things. Uh, people didn't have buses that could transport people. So it, 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 it was a learning experience. It was a great opportunity for me. It was a lot of blood, blood sweat, and tears. And I really was hurt uh, many, many times because of trying to do what was right. 
And so you're going to feel all that when you read this because I've tried to be very, very honest that you're going to feel my heart and what these people went through. And, and you, will, you will just be elated to know that when people were told they could never do something, where those people went just by giving them the opportunity, supporting them and, and, and showing them the way. And um, so I'm looking forward to this book being finished and, and you know, published. And hopefully then once it's done, then we can come back and do another radio show and I can share some of the stories, maybe read some excerpts from it that I feel like that will really bless people. Oh, yeah, I, I would really love that. And, um, you know, for people that don't know, I, I use a wheelchair myself. And so I understand uh, about the struggle and facing discrimination and having to overcome those kind of things and uh, having once been part of a group called adapt american disabled for attendant programs today i um, spent a lot of my early years with disability involved in activism and doing uh, civil disobedience and things of that nature to try to get uh, laws passed for um you know, um, for like long term, as far as care at home and community based services rather than nursing home facilities and uh, also accessible public transportation and uh, things of that nature. And so I do understand that struggle as well and have written about it in a book called A Different Way of Being. But yeah, I do look forward to that, Dr. Joy. And, uh, we I can't wait. Yes, I, I can't wait to the opportunity for us to share about things like that. And, you know, Zen, we've been very fortunate that God brought us together because we have so much in common right. that that it, it, it just sometimes I'm amazed how God sets your path to meet someone yes. and to get to know them. So I'm excited that you understand the struggles that, you know, that people are going to read about uh, right. in, in this new book. And I think it'll be something that we'll be able to share a lot about things with, because I don't think there's a lot of things that are written about how the struggle is. And I think that this is an indication for people to take note that handicapped people have a right to life. And I think oh, you're yeah. just, you're, you're such an inspiration. I mean, always talking about, <laughs> always <laughs> laughing, say if your ears are burning, I'm talking about you because I feel like you, uh, you, you are uh, the kind of individual that I always wanted my clients, if I could ever make them see that somebody could be successful and somebody could do this, even though they were handicapped, not to be limiting themselves. If I could ever find that person for them to focus on. And that was the thing and within the facility that I was, if I could just get that first person that I used to call my Jonathan Livingston Seagull to fly higher than anybody uh -huh. had ever flown. And, and I finally was able to do that. And then it was like the chain reaction that if so-and-so can do this, I'm willing to try it. And then, you know, what they were able to do, like I say, I'm just, I'm excited to be able to talk about that. Hopefully in a couple of months we can have a show and let me just, like I say, talk about each one of those people and what they mean. And, and hopefully it will be an inspiration to people who are struggling with it, you know, all kinds of handicaps. I mean, you can right. be handicapped in all different ways, mentally, emotionally, yes. physically, all that kind of stuff. And, and once you see that there is a way and that God has a plan and that you can make it and you can become better, I think it's the hope that we need in a world right now that's very chaotic and especially for people who are uh, who are handicapped because this is a this is a tough life for people who are normal who have <laughs> right. normal physical capabilities and now we're dealing with all this other stuff and, and the seriousness of it. So um, I'm looking forward to this and I, I appreciate you all doing this, you know, for me and allowing me to uh, bring something of this nature to the world to be able to read about and understand about. Yeah, of course uh, we will fully support you and whatever you decide to write, uh, you know, you are, uh, family to us, Dr. Joy. And so, yeah, well, whatever you are putting together with regard to your research or life story, we do believe that is uh, important to the world to to have that and to be able to read and study your work. So, um, But with regard, now that you have caught up and were able to get this book and finally finish it, uh, any ideas on what you will be going into 
next as far as a topic of research or specific um, book? Well, uh, I think I think the thing that I, I'm really struggling with, I wanted to do when I was young, the first book that I ever uh, published was uh, a poetry book called Colors of Joy. Uh-huh. And that's what set me on the path. And I'm really wanting to do something it, that's in a poetry kind of thing that you read that will be inspirational to help you uh, move closer to understanding God and what it means to in your life. So I'm, I've been working on that for um, a number of uh, years in the back of my mind, putting things up, thinking about this and whatever. It would be a small, it would be a small book. It would be a quick read. It would be something that you could use on a you know coffee table and just pick up and get inspiration from. I think that I want to try to do something like that. But the next topic I want to uh, write about as far as research, pineal gland. I uh-huh. just feel like the pineal gland has that most people have not had a clear understanding. In my other books about it, but I just think that there needs to be book and it's really hard for me because then you know i I cover a lot of different fields of study and all the research that i do and and all the books that i do i mean so me focus me focusing on one little aspect uh will will be a difficult task for me because i see the world in, in in different little pictures because i i can put it all together into a big big picture it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle each one of those pieces has a reason to be in my book. But when you get through the books, you see the whole big picture. So I think that if I decide to do this pineal gland, uh, you know, I'm going to focus more on exactly that and how Satan has manipulated the world since we were cre- really uh, in Eden, the Garden of Eden. And you and I have talked about the Garden of Eden and, and how all of that transpired. But I think that him getting into our head making Eve question what did God say and then using that to step into a situation where he was able to birth a seed line Uh and then compete against really God, the creator throughout history and, and walk it down through, you know, all that. I, I, um, I think it's just a fascinating thing that our mind and our, and our thoughts are literally that they are harmonically designed. And, you know, many times I've talked about that when we, whatever we think, do or say is kind of recorded, whether you say it out loud or whether you think it, whether you do it, in a, you know, talk to yourself in a closet, God is hearing everything. And when the end comes, I mean, you could go in your closet and cuss everybody out that you know and use profanity. You might think that those people will never know that you are talking so mean and ugly about them. But the person you need, I mean, not the person, but the being that you need to be worried about. It's not the 10 million people or five people or three people or two people that you just cussed out with the worst words you could find. Your worry needs to be that the person who now has it recorded (laughs) to bring back up to you one day while you're standing in front of him at at judgment, you know, that's the thing. You think it's not going to ever be remembered, but because I've done so much work with the pineal gland and so much work with hypnosis and understanding that the brain has this great capability like a computer. I mean, you can go back to your emails whenever you started and bring them back up and read, and read exactly what you wrote and exactly what you said and whatever your mind, your brain has that capability and it's not something you can kind of go in there and say, delete, delete, (laughs) delete from God. The only way you can ever delete what you have done in secret or in reality or in front of people is through the power of Jesus's blood. That's your only delete button. If you don't delete the things that you have done in your life that are sinful with the blood of Jesus, you are never going to be able to delete them. 
And if you don't choose to become a Christian and be a Christian, that means that, I mean, you know, we live in the flesh and we make stupid mistakes and we are human. But if you keep doing things and you are not fervently, truthfully praying for forgiveness and you continue to think I can get away with this, I can ride the fence, I can be lukewarm, I can do whatever I want to do, I'm never going to have to pay for this. People might not know about it, whatever, however you justify everybody's doing it. If so-and-so is doing it, I can do it. It's no big deal. When you don't cover that with a prayer of forgiveness for covering that and the blood of Jesus covering it for you and you don't make it into heaven, then when the great white throne comes up and you have to stand up there before God, you are going to have to listen to everything you've ever thought, said, done in secret. It's all going to be brought right before you. Yes. And and that's the thing. We, we're so used to getting what we want, like right now, right now. We, we have lost, we're a generation that's lost the ability for delayed gratification. You know, we used to be told, well, now, if you do good, you know, in six months, you'll get this. Well, now everybody wants it like right now. If I do this, I want this right now. I want this right now. And so delayed gratification goes away where you're selfish. I want it. 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 I don't have to wait. I want it now. I want my way. I want my way. And when you do that, you're not understanding that delayed gratification, if you do right, delayed gratification is going to reward you. But if you do wrong, you're going to have to, again, one day stand before the creator. And you're going to have to do it without the blood of Jesus to cover you. And he's not going to say, well, I I just said that. Nobody heard it. He's going to say, Uh, My child, did my word not say that you are not to use blasphemy, that you are not to do this to your brother? Does my word not say that you are your brother's keeper? Does my word not say you are not to use profanity, that you're not to let those things come from your mouth? He's going to say those things to you because his word tells us, don't be doing this. If you were doing something behind his back, if you were, I mean, if you were stealing, if you were doing whatever, whatever you're doing, that's a sin. And you know that it is a sin. Then he's going to call your hand on it. Yes. And he is going to expect you to stand there while you listen to everything you have thought, done or said. And so if you think that you did this behind somebody's back or you did this somebody in a closet, you know, you went in a closet or you, you know, stole something and you took this and nobody knew it. The Again, per- another person finding out is not your problem. They're not going to have you on judgment day standing before them. You're going to be standing before the creator and he's going to be asking you the questions. Why did you talk about your brother like that? Why did you talk about your wife like that? Why did you hurt your children like that? Why did you steal? Why did you take? Why did you drink? Why did you take drugs? Does my word not say? These are the things. Does my word not say? Relationships need to be a commitment to God. They need to be covenant. Does my word not say a man and a woman need to be married? Does my word not say that two men should not lie together? You know, does my word not say you're not to be out rioting and carrying on and not looking after your brother? I mean, you will not be able to stand against the truth. I don't care what excuse. You can say, oh, well, they made me do it, or so-and-so was there with me, and they did it. You know, how we do excuses now, because if somebody gets caught, you know, let's just say when we were... (laughs) When we were little <laughs> and mama would come in and she'd catch my sister and I maybe eating it, you know, eating a cookie out of the, the, the cookie jar. And she would always tell us, now, girls, you know, supper's about on the table. Don't be eating a bunch of junk because you need to eat your meal. And then if you get through eating your meal, then you can have, you know, a cookie or some kind of dessert. Well, you know, like little kids. There's a cookie jar. Nobody's in the kitchen. It won't hurt to tap, you know, one. And, <laughs> and so one. my sister says, <laughs> you know, come on, Joel. We just eat one. You know, go ahead and eat <laughs> one. 
So we'd get the cookies out. Mama walks in and we, we're going like keeping our mouths like really shut, really <laughs> like smiling at her, you know. And she clearly doesn't have the word stupid written across her forehead because she's looking at us and our and the way we're acting. I mean, it's like a deer in headlights. When people lie, you kind of know if you watch, right. if you study people who lie. And of course, I had to do that when I was in college. But when you look at them, you can see that deer in headlights. Oh, my gosh. They, <laughs> they know that I've lied to them. But I'm going to act like I'm not lying. So we would stand there in front of my mother <laughs> and go, she'd go, Joy, what you got in your mouth? Nothing. <laughs> right. I'm not doing anything. You're trying to swallow it whole, you know, without getting choked on it. But, it, you know, if she said, did I not tell you not to eat those cookies? If I went, well, Gay told me to do it. Hold on, Dr. Joy. Hold on. We'll be right back, everyone. Every day, questions arise. Are the stories in the Bible true? What if I told you that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses? Which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible. Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us every other Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Zen Garcia as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together. seekers are constantly studying alone. But there is a place where we can come together. The Digital Readers Club is our online ecclesia meant for those who've forsaken churchianity but still want the closeness of a family to study with. Join us every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to put together the puzzle pieces of truth scattered throughout the ancient scriptures. Hello everybody, as you know, in our Digital Readers Club, we just finished the Great Commission 3 on the end time apocalypses and are now moving forward because of your vote into the Yahushua Christ, the infancy, gospels, early childhood, and lost year narratives. And so in this particular book, and the reason I compiled it is because there's only one account in the entire Bible that relays anything with regard to the youth of Christ. And it is the story of when he's 13 years old and he um, leaves Mary and Joseph and they, retracing them st their steps, find him teaching the rabbis and the elders in the Holy Temple, the Jerusalem Temple, about the mysteries of the heavens. And so, I wanted those of us that are believers and that hold and have faith in Christ to have the fullness of the stories and the accounts of his early life that are available to those that wish to know more. And so that was the reason for the compilation of all of these accounts is to give you better insight into who our Savior Messiah is and how he was, even in his youth, without question, he was the fullness, the incarnation of God, and that he had the authority, even then, of life and death, and that Mary used even his bath water and his swaddling clothes to heal leprosy and to bring people out of their demonic possessions. And so, I believe that the study of this material will greatly bless your life and help you to better understand the core tenets of why we believe on him and know without question that salvation is through him.
Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. I have sworn unto you, ye sinners, by the Holy Great One, that all your evil deeds are revealed in the heavens, and that none of your deeds of oppression are covered and hidden. And do not think in your spirit, nor say in your heart, that you do not know, and that you do not see, that every sin is every day recorded in heaven in the presence of the Most High. From henceforth you know that all your oppression wherewith you oppress is written down every day till the day of your judgment. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Dr. Joe, I wanted to turn it back over to you. I know you were um, making a point before we went to break there. And yes. so I really, you know, and, and I really should say that my sister was named Gay and my name was Joy. So everybody always wanted to know if our mom and daddy was named Happy and Smiley. <laughs> 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 but anyway, she was younger than I was. So, you know, I was always blaming her for us getting into a problem when it was usually <laughs> me instigating the problem. So if mother asked me something, I said, well, gay made me, <laughs> made me do it. But what I'm trying to make the point about is that um, my mother wanted us to do right. She was trying to teach us to do right. But we thought that we could tell her story and that she would believe it. Uh, and and. And that's the thing is that it was a disappointment to her because she wanted us to do right. But at the same time, she gave us an opportunity to tell the truth. You know, what what's in your mouth? We did not do it. And then when she, you know, came clean and looked at us and said, look, did I not tell you all not to be eating cookies before, you know, before supper? Then you know, she expected us to follow her guidelines. And, you know, the Bible says, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Right. So I, my mother was the disciplined person. It wasn't my father. It was my mother. And uh, she would take us into the bedroom and she had a little stool there and she'd tell us, put our hands on that little stool, which made us bend over a little bit. And she had like a little ping pong paddle. <laughs> <And> <laughs> she would spank our little you know, fannies. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we, of course we think she was killing us and, and it wasn't, but you know, we would cry and whatever. But you know, the thing is, is that we have sin nature that's built within us. What we don't always understand that there's a judgment day, just like my mother would immediately address the issue. She didn't, she didn't let us continue to lie to her. In other words, she didn't say, Oh, okay. It's okay. You know, um, uh, whatever. She said, this is the precedence that I'm setting. In other words, this is the rules of the house. You know, I've explained it to you. You can have this, but it's at a certain time. You've got to follow those guidelines. She was, she was, you know, teaching by doing this, she was teaching us parameters. She was teaching right. us how to follow the law, how to follow what God in a small way, she was teaching us what we are to do to our Father in Heaven. If our yes. Father in Heaven tells us in a manual He gave to us to to read, which most people don't read the Bible, and it's you know it's like going to take your driving test without reading the manual. How many people can pass? You know, uh, you, you need to read God's manual. He gave us a manual. He told us exactly everything in that manual we will ever encounter. He told us if you will do it like this. You will have no problems. If you don't do it like this, your life's going to be miserable. You know, and I've, I've taken it outside the, what he's you know, explained to me to do. And it's, it, I've had a miserable situations in the past with some of the things that I've chosen to do by not listening to exactly what he said. When I have to stand before him, if I'm not covered by his grace and mercy, then I'm going to get a spanking. You know, I'm going to I'm going to be dealt a hand just like my mother dealt her hand to punish us. Thank mm -hmm. goodness we live in a world where when we do wrong, you know, it, 
I think back many times when my mother would ask me something if I had done wrong. And I would just go, oh, you know, she's caught me in this. And I would just go, okay, you got a choice. You can lie to her and she's going to know you're lying. You know, mm-hmm. because she was not stupid. It, you know, she, right. even though you might think stupid is written across the forehead, it was not. And Or either you can say, I'm confessing. You know, there were times that I made wrong decisions and I would just look at my mother and go, you know, mom, I did that. And I was wrong. Yes. And, you know, I, I will take the punishment of whatever you're going to give. I'll take it. And I'm sorry. And I ask you to forgive me. There were times that she would say, OK, I accept your forgiveness, but I don't ever want to see you or hear you do that again. Now, if I thought, oh, man, I got away with this, you know, she's not going to do anything. (laughs) I can do this again. And I was stupid enough to do that because we all are, you know, won't find out. And she found out again. Then me standing before her going, Mama, I'm so sorry. I promise not to do that again. She look at me and go, didn't I tell you the first time not to do that? Now, this is the second time, and apparently you didn't mean it the first time, so either you're grounded or you're going to get a spanking or whatever it was age appropriate for, for whatever. You can't drive your car. You can't go out on a date or whatever. Right. There, was a, there was, you know, the, the punishment was justifiable by the age that you were. And, uh, and so what she was doing, Zen, what our parents that we grew up, especially in the younger the generation that we grew up in, were trying to teach us to follow the law. To be truthful, yes. to tell the truth, even even if you messed up, to say, look, I, I, I did wrong. Please forgive me. And to mean it, to not just use that to get to get out of it or get a, you know, not get a spanking or not get something to happen to you. It, it was better to just tell the truth. So it, it taught me how to deal with life. And that's one thing that, you know, that I wanted to bring up tonight. And that's why I was leading into this is that the spirit of lawlessness comes about in a generation that never had a mother and a father that said to a child, we have parameters. Uh If you're going to be in this house, these are the parameters. You don't follow this. This is your punishment. They were doing a small scale of what our Heavenly Father does. Now, you know, we can be forgiven 70 times 70. You know, God tells us as long as we are fervently asking for forgiveness, we are forgiven. There's only like one thing that God never forgives you for, and that's turning your back on him and saying, you, you deny the Holy Spirit. You deny yeah. that he existed. That's the only thing that, you know, he would never forgive you for just turning away and walking away. Everything else he will. So he's a little bit more forgiving than my mother was. Mm-hmm. Because after about the second or third time of me not mean, you know, her believing that I didn't mean it by continuing to do something, then the punishment got worse, 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 and worse, and worse. To, you know, it was almost unbearable if you couldn't drive your car or go out on a date for, you know, six months. That kind of really would hit home. So I think that where we have failed uh, in, in doing this with children, we have allowed them to do my own thing, not take responsibility for bad behavior, not be held responsible when you knowingly do wrong. And it, and from where it goes from being in the family unit to being out on the street Mm -hmm. and you have a cop come up and he says, get out of the car, get out of the car with your hands up. Now I was raised that somebody in authority, cop, my mother, the school teacher, the principal, the superintendent, the coach, when they said, Joy, 
come here, sit down. You know, I listened. Mm -hmm. I didn't open my mouth. I came and I sat down. Regardless of whether I had done anything wrong, they were in authority. Okay? If a cop pulled me over, and unfortunately I have to admit, I was a fast driver. <laughs> I <laughs> love fast. F-A-S-T, I love fast. In fact, I had a CB radio when I was in college, and my call was the white lightning. It was not the drinking. It was as fast as white lightning can strike because I was usually running that fast in a vehicle. So if I got pulled over, which I did a couple of times, and the state patrol was behind me and he says, young lady, get out of the car. Get out of the car and put your hands on top of the car. I got out of the car. I put my hands on top of the car. If he said, get on your knees, I'd have got on my knees. If he just said, lay down on that cement and don't you move, I'd have laid down on the cement and not move because he was in authority. Right. Regardless that I had done nothing wrong. I know one time I was doing the speed limit at about 56 miles an hour instead of 55 and I was pulled over and I was like my gracious one mile over the you know and I'm really ripping myself about you know here I am and I'm gonna have to explain to my dad you know another ticket whatever driving too fast um and when the cop came over to me and you know he was gonna be like this you know I'm starting to see you a little bit too many times um and and I found myself wanting to say, but officer, how fast was I going? You know, well, you were going over the speed limit. And I'm thinking, yeah, one, one mile per hour. And what I found myself doing was trying to question his authority. But what happens then, because I had been raised the way, the way I was, I said, yes, sir. No, sir. Where do you live? This is where I live. Da, 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 da. And that is how we have survived for millennials. Uh -huh. Because we have been following what God expected for us to do. And most times you had a little bit of criminal behavior back when I was growing up. But people just typically tried to do right. They didn't fight the police. They didn't run from the police. They didn't shoot the police. They listened to authority. And that is something that now, because we said, okay, in the first grade or whatever, every child's a winner. Well, there's something to be said to give people opportunity. And believe you me, because I work with handicapped people, I understand that. But to just say, it doesn't matter if you apply yourself, you're going to get a trophy. It doesn't matter if you work hard or you don't work hard. It doesn't matter if you clean your room or you don't clean your room. It doesn't matter if you have a part-time job or if you sit on the couch all day and you're a couch potato and all you do is watch cartoons. I mean, you, you have to realize that the moment we took the Bible out of the school system, we were unable to do a paddling in, in a school. And, you know, if, if we were called out by teacher, those teachers knew my parents and they called my parents. <laughs> so I didn't only get a problem at school. When I got home, mom and dad were waiting, wanting to know, what did you do? The teacher is called and I better not be lying because they knew that. That authority would not be calling if there was not something wrong. And so they would reprimand me again about, you know, the wrong behavior or what I should have done or what I needed to do. Uh -huh. We lived in a generation that did that. We all grew up in that older generation like that. We followed the law. We didn't question the law. We are a democratic society. We have a process, just like when my mother said, you know, what, what did you do or did you do this, Joy? I had the opportunity to just stand before her and clearly tell her the truth 
or I could stand before her and lie. Now, if I'm caught in the lie, no different standing in front of a judge or a, a jury or whatever, then you're going to have to pay a price. But when we say to criminals, oh, well, that's not too bad. You know, we're going to let you out. Maybe you won't do it again. You're teaching people not to follow the rules. In schools, if you don't make people follow the rules and strive for better and have parameters, children want parameters. They really don't want to just say to them, well, go do whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter to me. Just do whatever we want to do. We have gotten to the point that society, because of our greed of wanting more, we don't have the setup in the families like there once was where the wife right. stayed home, looked after the children. The father went to work. Now, I was born and raised on a farm, so everybody worked. It took everybody, you know, the child labor problems and this <laughs> <laughs> that they have now that a child can't go out and drive a tractor. I was driving a tractor when I was six years old sitting in my granddaddy's lap. So I have been I was raised that you get up in the morning. You have your chores. These things have to be done. And everybody's working together. And it was hard work. It was in the hot Georgia, South Georgia sun every day in tobacco fields, cotton fields, corn fields, peanut fields. It, it was doing hard labor as a young kid. I mean, I had a croaker sack tied to me when I was six years old in a cotton field, picking cotton. I mean, we would pick those little bowls and they would clip your little fingers. They'd be so tender and those things would bleed so bad and they would hurt. I mean, it was it. I wrote about that in my book, Parables of Joy on a Georgia farm. And the reason I wrote that book was for people to see what it was like to grow up back in those days where there was rules and regulations and things that happened that make you what you are and who you are. So what I'm trying to say in all of this is that because we have spared the rod in the generation that's coming up, mm -hmm. we have a lot of spoiled brats. Right, right. And, you know, we went from paddling in school systems to timeout. And then we went from putting them in alternative schools and trying to keep them in the school and trying to get them out. You know, you pamper, pamper, pamper. Nobody's making them follow guidelines and rules. Because now the family unit, if you call them and say your child's misbehaving, where I would have gotten a paddling again, they go, what you doing calling me about my child? My child would never do something like that, you know, uh -huh. and they don't defend authority. They don't look after authority. Well, then that sets the child up to play people. And, you know, we've all seen this and people who uh, are, are raised in a family that their mom and dad's divorced or separated. The kid plays the mom and dad against each other to get what they want so that right. they don't have to follow the rules. Right. So we've had a society where now. We had children born out of red, wedlock. I mean, that's been the worst thing is the fathers have not stepped up. The government stepped in. The government gave checks. The kid grew, out, grew up without a father. The mother was working trying to make ends meet. The kid did not have any discipline. And then what happens when they get 16 years old? Oh, when they were, you know, when they're eight years old and they're already stealing somebody's bicycle Mm -hmm. Or, you know, shooting somebody with a BB gun or, or killing cats by running over them with lawnmowers. What are, I mean, what is going to happen when that child who's so frustrated by not having parameters, how are they going to deal with society without parameters? And right now on the books uh, is the desire to get rid of our police forces, to defund our police forces, mm -hmm. to keep. People from having to follow the law. And, you know, Zen, the thing about it is we talk about this on a lot of the shows. We know that we're living in end times. And I know the show we did the other night that you referenced with John uh, Baptist on Tribulation Now. Uh, we, we try to establish that we are living in end times. And the reason we know that is because certain things are falling in line to the T. Mm -hmm. And I said that night that the thing that I had noticed that was the closest to what I think the end of days is that spirit of lawlessness. And, and I think that we literally 
are at the threshold of the tribulation because it is so clear that, you know, we, we hear that Jesus describing in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that there's going to be these wars, these rumors of wars, these pestilence, these famines, these earthquakes in various places. But more than anything, lawlessness will abound. Lawlessness. And so I think that that's the thing is that when you see in Matthew 24, 12, that Jesus said, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And that means that there's no rule of law. Mm -hmm. And the rule of law is what made society progress. If we'd all been running around like a bunch of animals with no law, we would have never formed civilized societies. Mm -hmm. You have to have a law. That's why when, when the Israelites were carried through the Red Sea, and Moses went up in, you know, to the, the Mount Ariat and those mountains up there. And God wrote with his finger on tablets. He wrote the Ten Commandments. Yes. And it was the intent to give people a designated understanding of expectation. Because if everybody's doing their own thing and nobody's caring if you kill this one, hurt that one, steal from this one, lie to that one stab this one in the back, shoot that one. I mean, it's, it's just wild, crazy chaos that never can move forward. And that's one of the things that being in a democratic set, setting where if things go wrong, we have a court system that you can go to with an attorney and you are, you are given the opportunity to prove your innocence. But yes. if we take away that capability and we go back to Mosaic law, where it was mm -hmm. an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you know, you shoot me, I'm going to shoot you. You take my wife, I'm going to take your wife. You did. The, I mean, if you just go back, I'm going to cut your hand off because you cut my hand off. I mean, that's the way that it first started out. And then Moses tried to show if you if there's this law, you know, that there are these rules, you know, you will not commit adultery. You will keep the Sabbath. You know, you will not covet. You will not, you will, you will honor your father and your mother. You would not, it, it was telling us those things that if we abide by, our lives will be perfected toward becoming a child of God who ends up in heaven. The pagans were all doing their things, having their sexual rituals, killing, pillaging, drinking blood. I mean, we know from the work that we've done that when the daughters of man had the sons of God come upon them and Cain's lineage, that they were destroying, pillaging, killing. That was the worst violence that was going on. That's what brought about Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. And then after that, there was expectation of, of God to follow his word, to follow his dictates, to to understand where he wanted us to go. And then, you know, we, we have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament, we have the words that are told to us how to live our lives. And if we don't follow those guidelines, then we fall. And what I'm what I'm yes. seeing is this falling is happening not only in America and of course you know, the Chinese, the Russians, the communists of the world have kind of already destroyed society in a certain way without giving you the opportunity for certain things. Because, you know, like in Tiananmen Square in China, when they had a little uprising, they just walked in there, blowed them all away. They didn't have a day in court. They didn't do anything. Nobody paid the price for doing that. No. That's the way they handle stuff. That's barbaric. It's, it's, it's not really a good positive thing. So when you think about what we have and how God tried to establish this with us, we in this in our society today have something that's great. But because we are becoming lawless, we will be like the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire did was wonderful, great, big. It could conquer whatever it wanted to conquer. But the moment that it started destroying itself with from within is the day the Roman Empire fell without a, fi uh, a, a shot being fired. 
Uh-huh. And in this country, I know you and I were talking about one of the videos that that you had sent me. In this country, with this this per- particular thing that's going on, I think it's called the the Green New Deal that you had right. sent me information that called the Sunrise Movement. Movement, yes. Yeah. And, and where people are being set up and brainwashed to do these riots for the purpose of using youth. In other words, people who do not have the understanding of the things I just talked about. Right. Because they haven't had the parameters set forth in their lives to understand that somebody is utilizing their brains against them. Yes, yes. Hold on, Dr. Joy. Very important points. We'll be right back for a second, everyone. Many truth seekers are constantly studying alone. But there is a place where we can come together. The Digital Readers Club is our online ecclesia, meant for those who've forsaken churchianity, but still want the closeness of a family to study with. Join us every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to put together the puzzle pieces of truth scattered throughout the ancient scriptures. Hello, everybody. As you know, in our Digital Readers Club, we just finished the Great Commission 3 on the end time apocalypses and are now moving forward because of your vote into the Yahushua Christ, the infancy, gospels, early childhood, and lost year narratives. And so in this particular book, and the reason I compiled it is because there's only one account in the entire Bible that relays anything with regard to the youth of Christ. And it is the story of when he's 13 years old and he um, leaves Mary and Joseph and they retracing them st- their steps, find him teaching the rabbis and the elders in the Holy Temple, the Jerusalem Temple, about the mysteries of the heavens. And so I wanted those of us that are believers and that hold and have faith in Christ to have the fullness of the stories and the accounts of his early life that are available to those that wish to know more. And so that was the reason for the compilation of all of these accounts, is to give you better insight into who our Savior Messiah is and how he was, even in his youth, without question, he was the fullness, the incarnation of God, and that he had the authority even then of life and death and that Mary used even his bath water and his swaddling clothes to heal leprosy and to bring people out of their demonic possessions. And so I believe that the study of this material will greatly bless your life and help you to better understand the core tenets of why we believe on him and know without question that Salvation is through him. Every day, questions arise. Are the stories in the Bible true? What if I told you that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible? Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us every other Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Zen Garcia as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together.
Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. All right, welcome back for a second hour, everyone. And for those that don't know the video that we are alluding to, um, I did post it on my Facebook page and did put a link into the chat room. We'll also uh, link it to the description of this video once it comes out. But you can search undercover investigation. Minneapolis riot was pre-planned. And it shows that it, as have other riots and as Dr. Joy and I were speaking about in the show that we did with John the Baptist, um, how the agent provocateurs uh, are paid for and they have been looking for an event like this to really stir and cause and incite riots and that they are also utilizing underage kids to um, protect themselves and to because they know they won't get in a lot of trouble and that they'll be released from YDC and also have their records expunged once they reach adulthood. Um, but they are organized and this background story really helps people to understand what's going on in the world and how it is that the individual, he is also part of um, training the police and is also training the protesters. And so it's the false left-right paradigm of controlled opposition uh, once more and that the police and state and local sheriffs and are being told to stand down and to allow the riots to happen and to get out of hand and that will be later pretext for cracking down on uh, American citizens, patriots, and Christians, and that we are the real target, the real enemy, and that's uh, why all this is unfolding in the manner that it is. But uh, Dr. Joy, I turn it back over to you. Well, I, you know, I'm amazed by how this really reminds me of the youth uh, camps and things that Hitler used. Right. I mean, he took the right. youth and he was really able to do what's being done right now by brainwashing. You're actually turning these people into little Manchurian candidates. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about that. I talked about that in my research. Um, because if you can take a young person who, like I say, has no parameters, they're so used to saying, well, I'm going to do what's right for me. It might not be right for you, but I'm going to do it because it feels good. I'm following my heart. You know, I'm selfish. Yeah, it, it, they don't have any care about what happens to other people. I mean, in this video, those, there's one lady that said, or a young girl that says, oh, when we saw it burning, we, you know, we were happy. We went out and had a drink. We were so happy that everything was on fire. And they were celebrating right. what was really occurring. And you can only say that when you remove God, like I, like I say, from the classrooms, when Bibles are not really talked about. I mean, when a long time ago, the, the Bible was what was people taught to people how to read. I mean, it was used inside the school systems. That's where our laws came from. If, if they've never had that and they're so being taught this self thing. And I saw that start happening even when I was um, in my uh, master's degree working on my uh, master's degree in counseling and psychology years ago. There was something called Maslow's hierarchy in which you reach self-actualization. It was all about you and mm. self and you overcame your super egos and all this stuff. And it was a push for humanism. In other words, it was a push away from following what God expects from you and letting you do your own thing. Man, I'm going to be happy. I'm not going to I'm not going to be sad. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And then they were teaching things like transcendental meditation, which would focus again on that pineal gland kind of opening up because I'm doing my thing and I'm, I'm together and I'm smoking a little dope and I'm going to get this, you know, this high and I'm satisfying me and, but you're opening yourself up to the demonic presences and things like that. Instead of going to a Bible and let's say reading the Bible, meditating on the word and that kind of stuff, it was teaching us Eastern religions to do this kind of stuff. So what I'm seeing happen now, you've got people who are teaching kids in schools who were involved 
and those kinds of yes. practices. And the people that were not, that were teachers that I had were not like that. They might have taught you what was going on, but it was not an encouragement for you to be doing wrong like that. Now, the people that I think that were in the next groups coming up, you know, they experienced this stuff. They were looking for the God within. They were looking for illumination of themselves. And so now they know how to play the game to form a mentoring candidate, which is a very simple thing. I mean, I've talked about that many on many radio shows about hypnosis. You can literally fix somebody to the point that when you clap or snap your fingers 10 years down the road, if you've got them programmed, and that's one thing about the pineal gland that I don't think a lot of people understand, how significant it is and controlling it is like a remote control. And it controls you in ways that you subliminally do not understand. And the example that I was taught in college was that watching a hypnosis situation, when the girl was told, who was sitting right next to me, while we, we were doing, while the professor was doing this uh, hypnosis thing, she was told uh, that when she come out of the particular thing, uh, hypnosis problem, that she was going to open the door to the classroom with the classroom door back when I was in college, it, in other words, if you didn't make it in there when, before the bell rang, that door got closed, you didn't come in late. You didn't, you know, you just missed uh-huh. that class, okay? Right. So it was, it was unheard of for a professor to open up the door until the class was finished. So yeah. when he brings this girl that he's had under hypnosis out of this situation, we're all sitting there waiting to see what she's going to do. And she gets up and she goes over and opens the door. And he looks at her and he says, why did you open the door? And she looks real funny at him and she says, because it was hot in here. So see, she didn't even know that she had been programmed. And so because she didn't know she was programmed, she could only answer a stupid thing, which was, it was not hot in there, but that's the only thing that her brain could fill in. So she had been used like a Manchurian candidate. The other examples that we had in college were that you will typically not typically do something that you would not normally do unless you're taught in your mind to believe it's something else. And for example, under hypnosis, you're told that there is a gun, a squirt gun, a water gun in the top of the dresser drawer in your mama's room. And when she comes in the door, you're to take that gun, that water gun and squirt your mama. Ha ha ha. Well, what's wrong is what's in the top drawer is a Smith & Wesson 38 Special. And when she walks in the door, you've got that Smith & Wesson 38 Special right in her face. And you go, bam! You believe it is a water pistol. So when the police show up, you're like a deer in headlights. Because you don't know why you just shot your mama. Because you have been programmed to do it. And you can't fill it in. And had I, you know, I was so lucky to have, the, the, the professor's name was Dr. Brennan. And I don't know whether he's still alive. If he is, I, I, I thank him for giving me this opportunity. Because I've used it so, many, so much in my research and so much in trying to explain how the mind can be programmed by, you know, videos, games, music, uh, by neural beats. And, and so what I'm thinking is that we're seeing children doing these crazy things like this, this Green New Deal and the Sunrise Movement uh-huh. that is talked about this writing. How do we know? I mean, for example, I talked about this in my book, Eden. Uh, there was a thing where they used Pokemon. And the children right. watching this Pokemon thing in Japan They did this flicker with the Pokemon on the screen and every child that was watching it went into seizures. So the brain was picking up something that you normally couldn't see, but it affected the brain. So in this case, how do we know that some, let's just say some software out there that has been really popular. Now I, I, I always thought that the, um, the one that get, did with the Guitar Hero, where you had a little guitar and you were watching these frets moving 
away from you and then the music was playing the beats and the light was going and then they'd have like things like crossbones and skulls and whatever dancing around and you're focusing on that movement well when you want to hypnotize somebody you want somebody focusing on the movement you want it to be a monotonous thing you want the sound to be like this and it's it's completely putting it into the brain into the brain while you think you're playing but let's just say that some smart person like uh, some of those people that were into uh, the psycho stuff back in the 1960s. I, I write about Jose Delgado that used a lot of stuff against the Russian embassies and, and sounds and stuff like that. Well, let's just say that somebody came up with this great idea. We can take software. We'll sell it to every kid, the Xbox, whatever. And in that software, we're going to teach them that there's going to come a time when somebody like this sunrise movement calls them up, makes them feel privileged that they are part of something that's going to change the world, that they're doing right, that they're going to have to do this to make things right, that the world is going to be a better place because we're going to take down the old way. We're going to have right. this new, this New Green Deal, you know, um, a Green New Deal. When, when you do that and you use this constantly, you can brainwash children to the point that they will do whatever. Now, in my book, Eden, the Knowledge of Good and Evil, 666, the volume one and two, as well as the Beguile series, volume one, two, one, two and three that I wrote about, I showed how simple this was in nothing more than secret societies. The secret societies have perfected it to the point that they allow their membership to chant. They have to memorize stuff. They have to regurgitate it in front of other people under certain circumstances that are very bad, like where their shirt is torn and there's got a sword at their breast and they got a noose around their neck and they're kneeling before a blue Bible and they've got their hand over the, uh, the compass and the, and the square and they've got something between them and God. They got a noose around their neck. Somebody is controlling and owning them. And I wrote, and I want to read this little excerpt. I wrote this in Eden about that to ensure the total commitment of candidates. An enormous amount of memorization is required in each Masonic ritual that has been carefully devised to psychologically increase the candidate's chances of becoming brainwashed. This psychological approach makes a candidate believe he is secretly gaining knowledge over others. The process affects the brain identical to the hypnotizing effect when one indulges into chanting. Over time, the brain gets a false sense of truth and begins to believe what the mouth continues to repeat. If you keep saying something over and over, the mind will eventually accept it as truth. Yes. Okay. So that's telling us, for example, people who lie. They can keep lying over and over and over until they start believing their own lies. They right. think they're right all the time. They never see that they've got a major problem. I mean, that's a mental health problem. People who have this split personality where they are, you know, to you, to your face one way and then behind your back another, they become a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, where they're conversing with themselves in a negative, in not a positive manner. It's always negative, negative, negative. They tend to have major problems with relationships and when that happens and you've got people out there who are trained to keep hitting you hitting you hitting you with these kinds of things that we see with the rioting and we know that according to this particular uh thing that you have up in the chat room that those candidates that they're using to do this were excited just like i'm saying you'll, you'll see if you watch that where the people were, oh, this is great. We're going to have a drink because this everything's burning down. Look at what we've done. Yay, yay, yay. They see it as a positive thing. And, and I, again, this is what I was telling a long time ago when I wrote this. The brain gets a false sense of truth and begins to believe what the mouth continues to repeat. 
If you keep saying something over and over, the mind will eventually accept it as truth. And that's one of the things that that God told us in his manual. Do not chant. This stuff about Hail Mary, full of grace. and all, Don't chant. The Bible says don't chant. When you chant, you set your pineal gland up to be opened up into another spiritual realm. Chanting, um, doing stuff that vibrates that pineal gland allows that process to get more and more and more and more until you believe the lie. We are told when people lie, you are of your father, the devil. God doesn't lie. You will not find one lie in his manual that he gave to us called the Bible. There's not a lie that he has given us in there. Everything is the truth. And he has told you, if you lie, you are like your father, the devil. The more you do it, the further away you're going from God. And unfortunately, if you continue to do it, you're going to have to stand before the creator. And when you start the line, he is is truth. He doesn't have stupid written across his forehead. He's going to say, oh, is that how you see it? Well, let's play it back. How about watch this for me? And it uh, play right back before your eyes. And you're going to be going like, oh, my gosh. He knows mm-hmm. everything that you ever thought, said, done, whatever. So when we look at these kids, how they're being brainwashed into believing that what they are doing is going to create a better society. You're right, Zen. They're going to come after the Christians right. because we're the people preaching and going, that's not right. The creator has told us that's not right. You are of your father, the devil. And when we try right. to make them behave, they get worse. Right. We may try to make them follow the law. They get worse. You know, it's just like this thing, like the, the video said, they wanted to blame it on, you know, the George, George Floyd situation. We know that that wasn't the case. They were waiting for an opportunity to seize the moment. Right. It's kind of like when I wrote about gun control, you know, they took things like uh, uh, it was Sandy Hill up there near. um, Was that the name of the school that was up there? Sandy Hook. Yes, Sandy Hook. They tried to use that. We know that there were people that were character actors involved in that. Right. It was something wrong. That's right. Not not right. And when you get mob mentality and you get all that going at one time then what happens is that where that crisis happened, the intent was, okay, kids with guns, we got to get guns off the street. So therefore we go after the, uh, you know, the National Rifle Association. We go after trying to get guns where you can't purchase them and you've got to do this and this and this and this to the point that you're trying to get rid of anybody having a way to fight against bad. Right. The real criminals. That's right, because really the law, you have to remember, God told us the truth. The law was written for bad guys. Right. If you know the truth and you're a Christian and you're following what God said, you're not going to get arrested. You're not going to have a problem. If, if a cop says to you, I don't care how bad that cop is. If he says, get out of the car and get on the ground, get out of the car and get on the ground. <laughs> they never stop and say, what did the guy do that was wrong? Just like the guy in Atlanta. What did he do that was wrong? He fought authority. Yes, if, he had, if he had not fought authority, gone to the jailhouse, got an attorney, then he wouldn't be dead. Mm-hmm. He would not be dead. So we blame people for overreacting. And I, and I would never want to be a cop in this day and time. And that's going to be oh, a goodness. problem. People don't want right. to work for nothing and then be abused and be shot for just the fact that you've got a suit on. Yeah. The, the thing is. That's going to be a problem. It's soon. going to be a problem. And, and once we get to that point, there becomes two things. We have a society that is chaos that's going to crumble from within. And the Russians and the Chinese are waiting for that to happen. Absolutely. They, keep, they keep buzzing us, checking to see, are we paying attention? Are we got our minds right. too busy on our Roman empire falling out within? Because the mm. moment that we get to the point that we can't control the riots and we have to send our military in, we've got Into a coronavirus the out there right now that you just said on the thing when we went to break, 
how that coronavirus is increasing. So mm-hmm. we put our military, we put the police officers in jeopardy along with people and they all get sick. Then who are you going to call when somebody's breaking your house, raping you, beating you, shooting at you? Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? Right. I mean, right. really? Right. Uh, yeah, and they're trying to defund, you know, the whole plot with the Sunrise um, people as well is to try to defund the the police officers and uh, sheriff's departments. And, like, what good is that going to do? I mean, that's just going to lead to greater anarchy. And yet, they don't even understand the agenda they're supporting. Uh, it's lawlessness, as you said. And then the whole thing of the communist, atheistic, those kind of principles, they don't even know what they're involved in. They're just following um, whatever's handed to them as far as the agenda. And that is, and the fact is, is that we know that Satan is the ruler of this world. Yes. We know that he has power over this, um, in this world. We were told that, we're told that in the scripture. And if we give in to his devices, he's a trickster, he is a beguiler. He is a liar. And if we give in to his devices, then we are making it become hell on earth, which is exactly where we are headed. And we're right. headed that way faster than I think anybody is paying attention to. Because we went from having little viruses, little situations, little up things and whatever, to having a coronavirus that we are nowhere out of the woods with this. We are just beginning to see what it's going to be because of all this interaction of people in the last, let's say, six weeks. We're, we're going to see when things started opening up, how many more people are going to get sick, the inundation of that, the military people that have fallen sick, the military people and, and people that are in the police that have died from being interactive with people out on the streets like that. If that continues to increase and increase and we don't see the need to care for our country, to follow the rules of our country, then we are headed for that downfall. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is, you know, I, I think I wonder about Trump and I know a lot of people have issues with Trump. But here's a man that was brilliant, brilliant businessman knows the game at the top level of international business. None of us typically have ever had that kind of knowledge of how this world works. Because at the top is that Illuminati group, it's the serpents, it's where Satan plays. Donald Trump understands that because he had to play in that arena. It's like any of us, if we've had experience in something, then we know how to play the game. We are smart. We are smart like God expects us to be as smart as serpents. Be wise. It tells us to be wise Wise like serpents. serpents, To know your enemy. To know what how you're going to be brought down. To know the game plan that's coming at us. Right. But we have been walking around with our little rose-colored glasses on, waddling around like a dumb bunch of sheep, and we have been corralled into a situation that we now have a situation where it's becoming a civil problem. You know, it's becoming a racial issue. It's becoming tensions of things that nobody participated in. None of us in the world anywhere were a part of a slave situation. Right now, there are women, there are children that are being used as slaves in the in the sex slave trade. That is a huge thing that, you know, we know that that Prince Andrew and uh, Epstein, uh, of course, did for it because I, I think surely he knew the the leaks that were involved in it, and of course oh, yes. would be able to explain all that. Our world is so inundated with evil in every aspect of it, and then you add the lawlessness factor to it, and you add the plague of this this virus that's bringing everything down. The economy, just think. You know, eight months ago, our economy was the best it had ever been. And right. what did it take to bring it down? A virus? Right. So, I mean, you, you, you have to see that it's a global pandemic. 
lawlessness is, is going on in other countries because they're rioting because we're rioting. It's like mass mob mentality. It's like packs of dogs who would not do this if there was one dog doing it. But mm-hmm. once you get that pack and you get the people trained and you get people, let's say George Soros has got character actors or crisis actors or whatever, Manchurian candidates. I mean, all this stuff seems like at one time people would call it conspiracy theory. When I did my research, I show you this is scientific fact. These Mm -hmm. things can be utilized to make people behave in the manner that we are seeing people behave. And they're happy. The Bible tells us there'll come a day that when you do good, they're going to think you're doing evil and they're going to kill you thinking they did right to get rid of you. Yes. Hold on, Dr. Joy. All right. We'll be right back for final segment, everyone. truth seekers are constantly studying alone. But there is a place where we can come together. The Digital Readers Club is our online ecclesia meant for those who've forsaken churchianity but still want the closeness of a family to study with. Join us every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time to put together the puzzle pieces of truth scattered throughout the ancient scriptures. Hello everybody, as you know, in our Digital Readers Club, we just finished the Great Commission 3 on the end time apocalypses and are now moving forward because of your vote into the Yahushua Christ, the infancy, gospels, early childhood, and lost year narratives. And so in this particular book, and the reason I compiled it is because there's only one account in the entire Bible that relays anything with regard to the youth of Christ. And it is the story of when he's 13 years old and he um, leaves Mary and Joseph and they, retracing their steps, find him teaching the rabbis and the elders in the Holy Temple, the Jerusalem Temple, about the mysteries of the heavens. And so, I wanted those of us that are believers and that hold and have faith in Christ to have the fullness of the stories and the accounts of his early life that are available to those that wish to know more. And so that was the reason for the compilation of all of these accounts is to give you better insight into who our Savior Messiah is and how he was, even in his youth, without question, he was the fullness, the incarnation of God, and that he had the authority, even then, of life and death, and that Mary used even his bath water and his swaddling clothes to heal leprosy and to bring people out of their demonic possessions. And so, I believe that the study of this material will greatly bless your life and help you to better understand the core tenets of why we believe on him and know without question that salvation is through him. Every day questions arise. Are the stories in the Bible true? What if I told you that there are hundreds of confirming witnesses which give intricate detail to the stories in the Bible? Have you ever found yourself deep in the rabbit hole with questions that no one seemed to have the answers to? Join us every other Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for our Ask Me Anything series with author and researcher Zen Garcia as he sheds light on the mysteries which have us all searching together.
Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. All right, welcome back, everybody, for our final segment. Uh, the show is just going by so fast, Dr. Joy. That there's a lot of things that I wanted to also uh, cover and ask you about, but I want to turn it back over to you and make sure that you bring out all the points that you wanted to, and then um, perhaps we can comment on that um, the video about these possible, if it's true, if Trump sees the Federal Reserve, um, and if, you know, what that might entail. But um, let me turn it back over to you. Well, I did, you know, I, I just really um, felt like the other night when we started talking about this lawlessness, lawlessness stuff that we really needed to, to talk about it because, you know, we've got people destroying monuments and we've got people yeah. d just doing things that are unheard of and breaking and stealing and burning and, and pillaging and killing I mean, it, it's it's like a, a a world gone crazy with violence, and of course, we know that with uh, people being out of work and they don't have paychecks, that that just makes people want to steal and do and whatever. And and then you you get this these politicians that delay things in an effort, really, I think, to really continue to trigger violence and civil unrest and people stealing and taking and whatever. And I think that you know it's such a force of evil. To use this, you know, for this lawlessness to really be going on, and um, I think that when you look back and it says, you know, in, the, in scripture, the coming of the lawless one, you know, we know that uh -huh. that's going to be yeah. a, an antichrist, and it's going to be according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and you know, it tells us also that when this lawless one is revealed that the Lord's going to come and consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy the brightness of his coming, which means it, that it, it's going to get so bad with lawlessness that that's what brings, that's what brings God, you know, and Jesus back yes, at the, the, at the end shortened. of days. Yeah. Exactly. And so if we see this, we have to say the book of revelation is literally telling us that there's going to be Jesus himself descending from heaven and end in this last battle by slaying the antichrist and his followers who clearly are a bunch of lawless people and never mm. have we seen the amount of lawlessness as we are seeing right now in such a way that, you know, a power of antichrist can come into being and people will get to the point because of our situation where they'll have to have a mark of the beast to be able to buy, sell or trade because of the, the, the you know, the pillaging and whatever. And, you know, that is leading up to money. And right now, you know, if you go somewhere, they really want you to use a credit card. They really don't want you to use money because money supposedly can carry the, you know, the coronavirus. coronavirus right. And so if you take it and you can put money into cyberspace like bitcoins where you don't touch it, then to be able to get to money, you're going to have to have a way of doing it other than maybe a credit card. And that could be, you know, the mark of the beast. So it's kind of like when you were talking about talking about Trump and the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has always been an entity unto itself. A lot yes. of people think because it says Federal Reserve, it means that it's owned by the federal government. The Federal Reserve has never been owned by the federal government. It's, it's an entity that was established over in England that the Rothschilds, because they own the gold, would be able to set precedence in the Federal Reserve as to what uh, interest rates would be and, and, and that kind of stuff that would be going on. So, you know, the fact that Trump has tried to seize that and take uh, some authority over it, it, it's still telling me this because of what I wrote about in the Bial series about these other countries who were having problems like we see here happening here. Let's just say Egypt when they overthrew their, their president uh, and these other countries where they overthrew their dictators and whatever. We were told it was because people were not being treated right. What we were not told in the research that I did is that all the banking systems were destroyed and the central bank came in and took over those countries. Everything went into a central bank. So right now, 
everything is becoming centrally organized. And we know that's going to happen because we are told at the end of days we'll have a new world economy, a new world religion, and we'll have a new world order. And the intent of that is to have it all in one place under one pyramid of control. And before we started up seeing uprises in like Egypt and different places around the world, they had their own banking systems. They didn't have to add answer to a one uh, world economy. We are mm-hmm. having to listen to a one world economy. And I was doing some research the other day, uh, noting that on July the 1st, I think it is, that Israel's annexation is supposed to happen with the deal of the century that Trump's going to try to you know, put in place. And it's called the vision for peace. And they're going to be trying to annex Jordan and some of the West Bank, you know, and uh, they want to put the Palestinian territory back into the areas kind of like it was bef- back in the day when it was uh, the promised land. Mm-hmm. So uh, never have those parts of that ever gotten back to where it needed to be. But we're, we're going to be talking about that in this particular vision for peace in the deal of the century. Well, the interesting thing is it's an, it's an economic plan. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you think about, okay, it's money. And so if money is in the hands of the central bank, regardless of Trump over it, whoever is over it, who has control of it, that centralized banking, then when it comes time for us to say, you know, you want your money or you want to keep fighting, which is it? Right. When you, when, I mean, that's this is something that's never happened. I mentioned this the other night on a radio show. It's never happened to have an economic plan for a peace plan. But that's exactly what we're looking at uh, in regard to that. And then, of course, uh, Trump, you know, is going to be hosting the G7 summit, I think, uh, in, in July as well. And what he's going to be hosting in that summit is that there's this G7 group uh, that have come to the understanding that the uh, the 5G technology that's being used all over the world that may have some connection to the coronavirus, um, that he's going to propose a D10 club. And he's going to add to the G7 countries. You've got the UK, United States, Italy, Germany, France, Japan and Canada as the seven, the G7 that we'll be meeting. But they're going to add Australia, South Korea, and India. So the intent is to try to get uh, the 10 members to represent more than 50% of the world's gross domestic product. And that would have an economic power to change the global scale of how you can use 5G technology. 5G technology is going to be able to do everything. Right, right now, China was, they had a company in China that was being able to give all the stuff. And it was, it what was the problem was, and what Trump and some of our people found out was that they have a back road into stuff. So uh-huh. you're not really secure. In other words, they could set off our missiles. They could do whatever with this 5G technology. So they've had to stop trying to use that global technological giant. I think it's, I don't know how how to say it, but it's H-U-A-W-E-I. Howie? I'm not sure how you say it, but that's their technological giant that's Uh that's for China. So when you start looking at this, you can kind of see, again, pieces of the puzzle being put into place to control the banking industry, how you get money, who gets the money, how it 5G will allow you to have money, and let's just say it goes into Bitcoin and cyberspace, how do they identify who you are? You have a mark. You know, is it going to be that this, you know, we've got all this going on now and the coronavirus gets worse and we have to have a vaccination, which we know that Bill Gates has been working on that has a tattoo type thing in it that will allow you to track and do whatever you need to do on somebody. The, all these things are leading up to what Scripture has already told us. There's a man of lawlessness coming. He's got a great plan. Yes. People are going to listen to what he tells them to do. He's going to be over the new world order. There will be a new economy. There will be a centralized government. There will be centralized money. You will follow these rules. If you don't, we're going to kill you. And that's right. why we see that if Christians try to go against it, we're going to we have to become martyrs because they're going to yes. say 
in the next, you know, the next things that's going to come down the pike, you either follow this or you can't buy, sell, or trade. If uh-huh. you don't do this, you're seen as going against the grain for good in their eyes. Yeah. They're going to see you as the evil. Yes. And if the days are not cut short, according to scripture, are going to be cut short and the catching away, catch us out of here. As long as you're a Christian and you're not doing something that's going to keep you from getting out of here, he will, he's going to come, but we don't know the hour of the day. We know the season and Zen. I think we're in the season. I think Uh, we're watching on the wall. I think we see, you know, uh, like the Jewish feast that when that, that sliver of the uh, moon comes up, we blow the trumpets, we run to the temple and we try to get in there before those doors close. If right. we don't have our lamps lit, like the five virgins waiting for this, mm-hmm. and we got them five virgins, we will be like them that didn't put that that oil in those lamps and couldn't get to the temple because you're going right. to get left behind. And if you get yeah. left behind, you're going to be living in a world so full of lawlessness that this will look like baby cakes mm-hmm. when you are left here and we're gone. Yes. Uh, which, Dr. Joy, I know we're getting down to the end of the show, but I wanted to ask you um, about this character uh, king john the third and your opinion on him and you said you had some insider information about um the this particular this, individual that's yes. coming on the scene this joseph gregory hallett who says he's the good king john the third and claiming to be king and messiah that's just amazing to me Right. <laughs> uh, when this all came, when this all came out. I had, yeah. I mean, I had people sending me emails to the point at night because I keep my phone and they were binging all night long because I have, you know, people that have helped me do research in uh-huh. the UK and and Ireland and yes. I have some people in Japan. I mean, I have people everywhere that send me stuff and they're, you know, they're it's daylight for them. <laughs> what, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what? There's, you know, my question was when I started getting all this stuff, like, whoa, whoa, where is this coming from? So I began to seek out the people that have helped me do research in the past that are from those areas uh, over there in Scotland and in uh, Dublin, Ireland, and uh, there in the UK. And what the deal is is the Queen is at Windsor. Uh, if civil unrest were to break out like it's doing here with Black Lives Matter and hot spots, Windsor Castle is not hard to defend. If you put her down at Sangraham, where let's say William and Kate are, then it's a little hard to, def- to defend. So they're keeping her in an area because of the unrest. And then you've got Charles, you know, he was over in Scotland at Burke Hall. And then I know, I think Camilla was over at Glockshire home, but they're doing this to kind of keep them all separate to keep them protected. Uh, uh, People were talking about the queen's public diary was not out well, and that it had been aborted or whatever. Well, it was due to the virus and her age. In other words, she cannot allow to get this because if she does and it makes her sick, then there's a problem and she's not going to let that happen. But she was out in Windsor Great Park. I mean, she's 90 something years old and she's riding a horse. I mean, there's pictures of her if you want to go on the Internet and look it up. I'm amazed. I hope I can still do that at 90. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, then there's Prince Andrew that's having to fight the legal stuff for the Epstein allegations. And that's right. all over the news. I mean, he's still he's still a royal. It's still going on. But, you know, this Greg Hallett is kind of like fake news. Um, and. If everybody that was in English, you know, aristocracy, where they believe that they, you know, have some code of whatever, if they all claim like he did, they'd all, they all got titles. In other words, there'd be a lot more of them be able to be nobilized really more than he could ever be. So you got to realize that uh, under what had happened with people having children outside of marriages and kings doing their things, that um, that these kind of illegitimate situations can happen. But it seems to me from with the evidence that the people that have been looking at this over there say that he's been at this game for years. It's nothing new. Um, and the fact that the court documents were actually filed in Lancashire, uh, Northwest England is weird. And a judge would never sanction uh, when he's appointed by the crown. I mean, that would that would not be even a possibility. Uh-huh. And so then you can look at the video that Amanda Pink did. 
and she's connected to him some way. But in this video that she does, this Hale and his two sisters all claim that he's delusional and that he believes what he's saying, but he's absolutely delusional. And that the documents actually prove that his bloodline was to New Zealand nations people and not to any line dating back from William the First, the Conqueror. So it's not a connection to the Tudors, the Stuarts, the uh, Hanovers, or the uh, Sex Colbergs and that kind of stuff. So you know, it's it's just that he's made a lot of money by PayPal decreeing that he's claimed to the throne and that the Windsors are frauds. Uh, you know, the really the. We, we know that, you know, there's been all these Ill- illegitimate births all these years. There's hundreds of claims. I mean, you can go back through history and you've got a bunch of claims and stuff like that. So the fact is the Windsors and some of the newspapers over there, their response is to ignore him and view him just as he's deranged. In other words, things are going on as normal there in Britain. So um, there were some people that were saying that Buckingham Palace, you know, had closed down. Well, Due to the public not being able to come in because of the virus, you know, that was the reason. The ro- then there's somebody was saying where well, the royal crest was taken down off the thing. Well, according to the people that I talked with, it's being repaired because it was smashed into pieces by a truck accident. And then as people had it that the palace windows were all boarded up. Well, they're boarded up because it's closed to the public tours. They're doing it for COVID and social distancing. They've reduced their staff because the Queen and Philip are in their 90s. So it's not like, and like I say, she was out riding a horse the other day in Windsor Great Park. She's perfectly fine. And um, the fact that this delivery truck hit the door is being repaired. Um, and then, of course, uh, William is very much doing his thing, representing the royal family. And he and Kate, they've done some Zoom videos. And they've been very popular in those Zoom because he's being seen like like Diana in touch with a common man. And they did like Zoom videos at these old folks homes. They were doing like bingo calling, you know, something that's never been done before because they're trying to get his image up as a caring prince and not sullen and and kind of like you know, outdated or whatever. They are trying to make him look like he's got this charismatic capability. So he and Kate are very much in front of the news media. If you get the papers over there, I've had several papers sent to me. I've looked at those papers. It's real. It's not fake news. Charles and Camilla are back doing their public duty, but at a safe distance. And the thing about it is, um, you know, Queen Elizabeth has been on Zoom and, um, Princess Anne has been on Zoom, but their public duties can't take place really until they're safe because of their ages. So really, they're, they're allowing Charles and, and William to handle the business. Everything is business as usual. So for those people that are thinking that all that stuff's right, so no, it's just a bit of false news. And, you know, for somebody to come out and tell, tell you they're, they're the Messiah like that, I, I'm like, please. <laughs> I, I, from the time I saw that, I was like, there's just something delusional about somebody like this. Because the Messiah... The Messiah is not someone that's going to be giving. Yeah, I'm the Messiah. You're going to be. You're going to be calling him Messiah. He's not going to be calling himself Messiah. Uh-huh. You're going to be calling him Messiah. You know. Uh-huh. You're going to be looking at him for the answers, and that's what we know that that's going to be set up. And the person has to be a prophet, priest, and king. And there's all these things that I know that you and I did a, uh, I think, two part series back some number of months ago about the yes. British line and the for, the formality right. of having to have a bloodline and all that. So. All that stuff has to be in place. It has to meet specifications what's in scripture. And I encourage people to go back. And if that, it, I guess that's still available then for them to be able to pull those yes. two up uh, and look at and listen to why, uh, you know, the royal family is, in, is where it is. And it's not going anywhere because it's going to end up being uh, the major player at the end of days in regard to the Antichrist and, and the controlling factor of what's going on in the world. Uh, I've been doing some research on Ephraim and Manasseh and some of the connections to that and the bloodlines that came out of the, you know, Joseph that was a part of the the, the original 12 um, uh, sons that were, you know, from Abraham and then Isaac and that kind of thing. So 
Jacob. So yeah. I, I, it's like I say, there's a lot more. You just can't come out and say so and so is this. You got to have the the research and the backing and all this data. And of course, like I said, we did that two part series. And if we need to do another series about something like that, then that could be a, a show think, in the future. I think we like should do day. that. Yeah, I think we should do that, Doctor Joy. And I know we're you know we're getting close to the to the end. And I kind of wanted to read. I wanted to read two things that I wrote in Eden that I ended Please. my book with, uh, because I feel like this is speaking to people who need to be Christians, people who are not Christians, people who are Christians to stay away from evil people. Choose your friends wisely. Don't mm -hmm. participate because once you get in there and you get with the wrong crowd, that mob mentality. Or somebody taking you down the road, the wrong road. If you're with good people, you're not going to do anything wrong, because they're right. not going to be doing anything wrong. Yeah. So I want to I want to read two bits of scripture, and and it, it, where it talks about this because this is God's words. This is our Creator's words to us, His children. And the first one is Psalm 26. It's called a Psalm of David. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with disassemblers. I have hated the congregation of evil doers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works, Lord. I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hands is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, in the congregations will I bless the Lord." Amen. And then the other one is second. This is my favorite. Second Timothy four, one through eight. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Yes. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Amen. And I think that tells us that what God expects. If we do that, if we keep ourselves from evil men, from being used by evil men, manipulated by evil men, if we will follow the guidelines of the creator, our lives are perfect. Mm -hmm. We always told we're not perfect because we fall to sin in the flesh. But if we could literally walk in those truths every day and guard our heart and our mind 
and treat people as God wants us to treat our brother. Never do anything to hurt them, to lift them up, to give of ourselves, to love them unconditionally, to love them with God's covenant of love. If men would love their wives or their girlfriends or their children as as God was, it says biblically, you are a man. You are to be in the image and act as of God. You know, you sub- yeah. women submit to that, but you submit to it because cr- the man is expected to die for his bride, just as Jesus died for us so that we will have eternal life. It's a, it is a huge fulfillment that that is why God created holy matrimony between a man and a woman. It can only be that way. You cannot call holy matrimony anything but between a man and a woman. It's scriptural. Yes. You can say you don't want to believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm the messenger, and I believe this. I'm the messenger. You don't shoot the messenger. If you want to take it up, take it up with God. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Dr. Joy. We'll set up another time and another show very soon. God Thanks bless all. Thank you. Man. Love you too. Be blessed. Good night, all. Shalom. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you in your seeking.